All right. It's Thursday at 4.20 p.m. Eastern. That means it's time for Office Hours, Aurora's weekly session for cultivators to hear from the experts and talk to each other about what they're seeing with their grows. My name's Keisha, and I'm your co-moderator, but I don't do it alone. How you doing, Mandy? Hey, Keisha. Man, can you believe it? We're already on episode 45. What an amazing community we're building here together. Speaking of, did you guys know that we're live over on YouTube right now? I'll be watching for your questions over there. So be sure you're following us on Instagram and TikTok as well. Um, One more important announcement uh, before we get going today. Anyone going to MJ BizCon in Las Vegas in a few weeks? You know, we'll be there. So reach out to us if you'd like to meet up while you're there. But you know what we're here for, your crop steering questions. So I'm going to throw it back to you, Keisha. Awesome, Andy. Thank you so much. If you're live with us here, have a question, type it in the chat at any time. Your question gets picked. We will have you either unmute yourself or I can ask it for you. Seth, Jason, how's it going? Very well. Pretty good, Keisha. How about yourself? Doing good. Nice to see you guys. We got some questions in from Instagram. And actually, there were a few that we uh, got last week that we weren't able to get to because the live questions were so on and popping. So I'm just going to dive right in. You ready? Let's do it. All right. Canna Ray wrote in a great question. They wanted to know, where is the best location to hang your Atmos 14? At the canopy level or above it? So my general rule is within a foot of the top of the canopy, obviously. Uh, while your plants are growing, sometimes that means it's good to raise it up. Ideally, what we're doing is getting the best sample to attribute what the plants are feeling in that room. And so obviously the closer it is to those plants, you know, within a foot of the top of the canopy, you're getting some of the, the microclimate in there, some of the reduced wind flow that the, the plants are pushing. Yeah. I mean, I, I think you nailed it there really close to the canopy top. We want a really average representation of what we're seeing across the room at the canopy level. So within a foot and then, you know, if you've got exhaust fence, dehue exhaust, fans, anything like that, probably don't put it directly in front of that, you know, source of change in the room because we want to capture that average look, not, you know, what is it right in front of my dehue exhaust? Because then you might go home and go, wow, it's 95 degrees in my room. I sure didn't feel like it. So we want to get, you know, the best representation possible of what's going on at the canopy level. Beautiful. Thank you so much. Um, Awesome. Looks like we got some sound we're going to be correcting here. Um, Thank you guys for that answer. We're going to move on to the next one. Chemical Grower wrote in, uh, they were wondering how to start with a low EC cocoa. Pre-soak the cocoa with CalMag? Any thoughts there? Usually you'll just want to soak your cocoa with whatever your fertigation is going to be going into um, veg. I mean, if, if that's what you're doing, your transplant. Um, so just use your feedy EC. Yeah. And you know, I, one thing I always can't stress enough to people when you get directions with a particular media, try following those first. So, you know, in cocoa, we've got a big range of brands. Some brands have a better wash than others. So if you get a brand that says, Hey, you should wash this, you know, X amount of times, one, two with straight water and nutrient solution, um, you know, pay attention to that. Certain brands of cocoa aren't washed as well. They have high salt levels coming in, not the salts we want. But like Jason said, we want to charge that up typically with our regular nutrient solution. So that plant has access to everything it needs right off the bat. And when we transplant into something with too low of an EC, um, once that plant takes off, it's hard to get it to stack up. You know, if we're way down around like 1.0 and that plant really needs three, every time we try to wash it up to three, that plant might just eat, eat it right back down. Yeah, set yourself up for success. Awesome. Thank you so much for that. Just a reminder to everybody who's on with us live, we want to answer your questions, get them to the experts. So don't forget, go ahead and post those in the chat anytime. We're going to keep moving on through our Instagram questions. Um, Gonzo396 was asking about thermal cameras. They were wondering if you guys could go into detail about these, the use of them and what brand works. You guys use thermal cameras much? Uh, I have in the past and... We got some weird stuff with the mics. Uh, yeah, we'll echo. I think I had a FLIR that I was using, and they're, I mean, as valuable for the plants as they are for the facility. So I guess we could probably dive in and talk about some diagnostics that we're doing, one with the plants and two with the, the facility. Uh, really fun. I, I liked getting up on a ladder and trying to take a vertical shot of the, the canopy, and you could basically get a bud count of it because the buds are going to be cooler so you get a really nice gradient showing you the hot spots in the plant and then obviously you get to see the cooler spots where the leaves are actively transpiring uh every once in a while you'll even be able to pick pick out a like a sick plant 
Um, I had one that was way warmer than the rest of the plants. And I, I went down over to the uh, substrate there and we were in soft sided cocoa bags and, um, shot the, the bag with a thermal camera as well from the bottom. And we could see that one of the drippers was uh, clogged up. So <coughs> that, uh, that cooler irrigation, you can definitely see its effect and you just going to be like a gradient away from the, the dripper. So, uh, those were some cool things I was doing with the plants. I always really wanted to you know, build an algorithm or something that would count my, my buds per, uh, square foot or square inch based on the trellis because the trellis showed up really well in there as well um so those are some of the plant ideas and then some of the facility type of stuff was monitoring fan performances so some fans were way hotter than expected um just getting an idea of the the room layout um by looking at walls and and those types of things Uh, lights you can check out if lights are bright and a little bit hot um kind of some of the ways that i used it yeah, I like using them for identifying microclimates in the room. And then actually one that I've kind of been introducing with a few clients. Um, if you've got, you know, especially security cameras or a fixed camera with infrared capability, but let's say you're running your room at nighttime, we're trying to figure out like, well, did we get runoff? Did we not? The graph looks like we did. Was it across the whole bench? Just like Jason was talking about positioning it so you can see just one pot that doesn't have drippers. We can also see that water go onto the table and see an effect there. So if we push enough runoff, we'll actually see that on the table. And it's a good way to just have eyes on your environment when you're not there. That's where I really see them come in as like overnight or at, you know, that nighttime room or the lights shut off and no one's there. Okay. We can start to identify certain heat sources or, Hey, where, where does all our heat go <laughs> when the lights turn off? Do we actually have a leak in the room? You know, we can really identify a lot of those things that um, are hard to see and feel uh, at, in a wider picture. about getting greater transparency, right? Wonderful. Okay. One of our attendees posted a question here in the chat. Um, They wrote in, when are you going to have to recalibrate the Terrace 12? Should ever have to. So when we ship it out, it comes with a lifetime calibration. Um, That being said, you know, if you're seeing some, some readings are a little bit weird, make sure that you've cleaned the prongs with some isopropanol or or other cleaning agent. Um, you make sure you're not using, uh, something that's too abrasive, like a scotch bright pad on there. Just make sure that their knife's wiped off and clean that salt buildup can cause them to, to read a little bit irregular. And then, you know, another thing is just that installation consistency. So make sure you are using your, uh, installation template tools um, so that you're getting at the right height. Make sure that they're nice and fully seated to the the white body of that uh, sensor. And, you know, make sure you're horizontal with the prongs um, and make sure that you're not reinserting into a hole. If you're in a, a hard sided plastic, make sure that you, you've cut out space so that Terrace 12 can fully contact the substrate. So, uh, you know, that, that being said of the 60,000 plus sensors we have in the field, I personally haven't seen much of almost any issue with with calibration long term uh, since we deployed these. Yeah, I mean, the Terrace 12 is, like you said, has a lifetime calibration. And actually, the original intent with that sensor was to be able to put it in situ out in the elements for a long amount of time. So during that development process with meter, they found a solution that tends to last for a long, long time in a solid state. That being said, it is a precise scientific instrument. So Anytime we're talking about, just like Jason said, sensor installation consistency, our height, that's got to be just perfect. You know, we're looking basically at a horizontal cross section. Um, As we go up in any media, that's going to change. So we always want to be getting it at the exact right spot. And then, too, you know, realize that any any media we're working with, whether it's rock wool, cocoa, peat, uh, all of this stuff is coming to you at a while. You know, we may compare about the prices that it comes at really it's a, it's a pretty cheap product. You know, if, if you wanted to pay 20 bucks per pot, we might be able to get some super finely manufactured consistent product. But if you're paying a couple bucks, a, a compressed per compressed cocoa brick, or, you know, buying one slab at a time, there's only so much manufacturing consistency that can happen. So when you get say one pallet of cocoa, you burn through that same brand, you get another one and you get a few percent difference on your field capacity readings. That's not the sensor that, you know, that could very easily be that batch. They set the machine differently. It's crushing harder this time. This time it's shredding finer. There's all these little inconsistencies. And then, you know, 
what that kind of translates into is we, we're always playing a game of averages here. You know, when we look across our crop, these are living things. And you can see when you go to take them down, you know, I, I challenge anyone to bring me a, a crop where they got like less than five grams variance per plant at harvest time wet weight. You know, that that's like how close we have to be to have perfect consistency across this. So, you know, you can get hung up on little details like that or remember that we can only do so much based on the technology that we have. You know, if uh, a great example is if you have a really high flow irrigation system. If the minimum you can turn on, you know, is a 200 milliliters, let's say, well, in a smaller pot size, like a gallon and a half cocoa, we're going to have a really big limitation there. So um, as far as calibration goes, you know, it is important. Um, but the bigger thing is making sure you're using them correctly, you know, like I said. And we also do have a verification method. We have a clip that you can put on and test. But like Jason said, it's highly, highly rare that we throw that clip on and get anything other than our desired tolerance range. Yeah. You know, one thing I even I forget sometimes is that these things are sensitive enough that just the oils on our skin from uh, handling the prongs can uh, affect the reading slightly. So uh, that cleanliness, installation consistency are really the best things you can do to ensure that the data you're getting is exact representation of what you're trying to sample. Yeah. And, you know, a big thing too, uh, that I always tell people, if you're really having doubts, you know, go look around at the table, do some spot checking. If you're, if you've got your sensor plugged in and do an outlier, don't worry about it too much. Like move over and look at what you can accomplish feasibly. On the other hand, if that outlier is worrying you really go check it out, you might just have a plugged emitter. You know, there are a lot of times very simple solutions to something that looks uh, like a, a cause for concern on the graph. So I guess I'll just start off with that one. Um, you're, you're not in a very steerable media for the size of plant that you're producing. So what you're doing is going super generative, which is probably putting out some kill, pretty killer bud. You're just, you know, might be confusing why you say like, why do I have a three or three and a half gallon pot? And my plants aren't as big as my buddy that's got a one and a half gallon pot. And what it comes down to is with that bigger media, I mean, you need a huge plant out of a three and a half gallon pot to really be able to steer properly. If we want to get that 15 to 25% dry back, that's going to be a lot. It's going to take a lot longer to achieve that with a three and a half gallon pot and let's say a four or five foot plant. So your, the, your biggest increase, honestly, would be getting off of the Promex or going to a smaller pot, at least, you know, start with maybe a two gallon pot size for the size of plants you're running and uh, see if you can actually achieve an appreciable overnight dry back and a decent, you know, midday dry back. Because if you can't get, you know, faster than let's say a percent an hour, we're not gonna be able to get that many P2s on. Like that's a reality for bulking. And that's kind of one of the secret sauces, I guess, to really getting that yield up is being able to get that bulking into place, which you'll never be able to do in an oversized media for the plant. Good things to keep in mind. Awesome. Yeah. Uh, I think we got a live question in the chat. So back over to you, Keisha. Awesome. Thank you, Mandy. All right. Michael wrote in. Michael, if you want to unmute yourself to comment further, please do. When burying a Terrace 12 in a mom pot, seven to 10 gallon pots, where would ideal placement be? Against the outside of the pot or a little further in? Yeah. So I've done quite a few mom pot installations and my personal preference is to to be a little ways into the media if you can if you're in something like a seven to ten gallon the reason just being is so our Taros 12 has a one liter volume of influence so when we think about uh what is it measuring it's it's trying to measure you know about the size of a you know one liter bottle or you know maybe a little bit bigger than a pop can uh around those prongs so if that's in an area that's um quite a ways away from the plant or, you know, just at the edge of the media, we've got a ton of surface area on something like a seven to 10 gallon pot. Uh, a lot of times they're even, the, you know, the fabric sided, we're not going to be getting a great sample of what the average of the water content in that, uh, container is. And that's usually what's the most helpful information. Uh, obviously if, you know, we're looking at the lower 5% of, of volume uh, based on how much water is in there, then we're usually going to overwater that mom. Um, and so, you know, being a ways in there, I, I like to think about quadrants, right? So if, you know, we look at what's the, one of the most average spots in that plant, uh, substrate that would represent an average water content. Well, it's going to be closer to say a quadrant within that uh, 
10 to 10 gallon. Yeah. I, I wish I had my placement tool here to give you an exact height on that, Mikey. I want to say it's around three inches for a pot that tall. It depends on how tall your pot is versus wide. But yeah, just like Jason said, think about where in the pot you want to be capturing that. You know, when we're talking about moms, we typically want to get it close. You know, even if you're burying it right dead center in the pot, that's good because, you know, if we're looking at that drier gradient, when Jason's talking about over watering moms, you know, that's why three months later you can have this beautiful mom that just craps out on you. Then you go grab the stem and it, you mean you don't have to break it over. It just falls over at the weight of your arm. And that's just because you've got so much root rot building up in there, which is obviously not desirable even to have in your facility. Um, so yeah, you really want to get it right in the middle and just remember, you know, fabric pots always make a difference. So if you had a really wide, shallow fabric pot, we would still be in the same boat just because it's going to dry out around the outside of that pot. So logistically, it makes it you know a little bit more challenging than installing sensors in a, you know, a production flower room. And this is the best time to do it for your moms is when you are transplanting into that seven to 10 gallons so that you can get that placement. You know, that sensor is going to be buried in there. And another logistical challenge is when you go to kill your moms, you might uh, you might need like a power saw to cut through the roots to get that Terrace 12 back out of there. And just be really careful that, you know, you're not including the cable as a root that you're cutting um, or, or even into the body of the sensor. So definitely a little bit trickier. Um, but if you are trying to optimize the, the growth of your moms and you are taking metrics and, and standardizing your processes, it's a worthwhile venture. Oh yeah, absolutely. To get some, you know, just to get any tracking on it. And for instance, like when we're talking about a seven to 10 gallon pot, I myself would end up probably with a decently high ratio of perlite in there, even up into that 20 or 30%, just because I don't want that root rot happening in the center of the pot. Well, what do I know about bringing perlite in? It's going to make getting that super consistent reading across my mom's kind of difficult. Like when I look at the graph, I might see some stratification, even though I think they're all relatively the same. The big thing to remember there is that we've got a few different variables that are playing that are going to make it hard to get a super accurate result. The bigger thing we want to see is that difference in dry bag. So we want to see that we are actually successfully drying back. We've got um, good transpiration going. Roots seem to be in good health. We've used enough water to warrant watering again. You know, sometimes we have instruments that are more, more accurate and precise than the media we're trying to measure allows. You know, if you stick one of these T12s into pure perlite, it's going to be very difficult to get a reading at all or anything believable just because we have so much air contact along that probe. Amazing. You guys, uh, Mikey just wrote in, uh, I went with four inches up and two inches out from the pot edge, putting the sensor tips in the bottom of my primary root bulb. I'll try to bring it a little further down with the next batch. Does that sound to you guys? It sounds really good. You yeah. Know? I mean, honestly, Mikey, I'd probably keep doing it the exact same way. Then you're going to, then you're going to establish your, your baseline and your own personal bias based on what you're seeing. But that's, what's important is that you have intuitive control of those moms rather than, uh, just guessing all the time back to the old hand watering in a pot that you can't lift up that, you know, <laughs> that never really works out too well. It's all about taking care of those moms. All right. Sending it over to Mandy. I think we have a YouTube question. Yeah, it's popping over on YouTube. Um, Iron Armor wrote in, what is an acceptable VPD fluctuation from day to night in an indoor facility? Or is it optimal for the VPD to stay static day and night? Typically static. That's the idea. But static VPD means a very dynamic HVAC setting to achieve that, right? Because we're going to be lowering temperature, lowering humidity to maintain that VPD. Um so yeah, keep it static if you can. Uh, if you are going to have some fluctuations, I typically like to see less than about 0.2 of a drop overnight, you know, anymore. And we start to get, it gets much harder to predict your dryback line as your plants grow. The bigger they get, the harder you have time maintaining VPD. Typically we see that overnight dryback line flatten out a little bit. And at that point, it's a lot harder to predict where we're going to land in the morning and a lot easier to overwater. And there's so much to learn about VPD. We should do a whole session just about it, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that we actually got another question right now. Um, Eduardo wants to know any good product suggestions for thrips in grow rooms? 
what, what are you allowed to spray? Where are you at? <laughs> that's kind of in this industry right now. That's what it partially what it comes down to. Like what's here? Are you in Washington? Are you in California, Colorado? Uh, are you in Canada? Cause that's a whole different strategy up there with what they have. Um, you know, typically for thrips, we go, you know, the classic, uh, you know, you has got your Azimax, you've got your heavy pyrethrin sprays, whether it's Piganic, Botanigard, et cetera. Uh, those are basically the nuclear option that kills as many bugs as you can. And then typically I like to bring in, you know, later in flower, try to avoid spraying in general. We don't, whether it's safe horticultural oils, I mean, do we really want to be spraying uh, soybean oil or cottonseed oil all over our buds? Probably not. So honestly, keeping your veg clean, being prepared to go nuclear in there to get rid of the thrips. Um, and then, you know, with thrips, the next extension, how clean is your facility? You know, do you have a lot of organic debris in your expansion cracks in your floor in the room? Do you need to caulk those up? How do your corners look? How, you know, thrips are an incredibly tiny little pest that can survive on all kinds of little bits of organic plant material between crops. So part of it's being clean, part of it's staying clean, developing those cleaning SOPs. And then honestly, we call it IPM. That means integrated pest management, not uh, pest extermination. <laughs> So realize that, hey, we've got an agricultural crop or a horticultural crop. We're always going to be dealing with this to some extent. So what we're going to do is typically bring in some beneficials. Um, there's quite a few of those that are available for different bugs and then look at like, OK, what is our economic injury threshold? You know, how much do I have to see before it warrants paying a lot of money to take care of it? So, you know, with the thrips. You're going to be battling it chemically at first, but then a lot of it comes down to just super deep cleaning and they're, they're hard to get rid of. You know, these are, these are pests that can go in and ruin a tissue culture lab because they are small enough <laughs> to actually get through gaps in parafilm and things like that. So if you're seeing them, you know, extermination is good, but remember, it's just going to be a dynamic thing. You'll probably be, be dealing with to a certain extent all the time, especially in this world we live in where you're not going to run your same six, six strains for the next 20 years. You're going to be switching them out due to market demand pretty regularly. That means taking chances sometimes and bringing in outside cuts and all the risks that come with that. Yeah. I, I mean, obviously, once you, once you have them, it's a lot harder to get rid of them than it is to think about uh, the prevention for next time. But that anytime I'm doing IPM, it's it's the thought of where, where did this come from? Why is it introduced into the plants now? Uh, was there some recent changes that are going on at the facility? Is there uh, some health of the plant concerns that was much more attractive to predation? Uh, just trying to trying to break down what are the, the steps after I take to mitigate the challenges right now? Uh, get, getting that process started for facility or plant improvement. Yeah. And honestly, step number one, one of the biggest things I see people uh, who are new to commercial cultivation struggle with, don't go from your oldest flower room backwards in your cultivation process ever. If you leave veg in the morning to go into a flower room, you're not going back in veg. If you go into a room that's two weeks old, you can go into a room after that that's four weeks old. That's fine. If you go into a four week room, you're not going back to the one week or two week room. So it's just developing SOPs like that. And then having uh the fortitude to stick to them, you know, among your teammates. Cause it's always, it's always tempting to just be like, ah, I'll just, I, I won't go deep in there. I won't go in by the plants. I'm just going to go fix that pump or whatever, rather than find someone else who hasn't been contaminated or go change and shower and all that fun stuff. So, I mean, a lot of the, a lot of IPM in general just comes down to keeping on those SOPs and not faltering. Did you leave the water on in the bedroom? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you know, and that's the thing, something like that, right? Like, Hey, I cracked it on, walked out. Someone said, Oh, can you come look at this in flower too? Well, okay. Now I, I just, I can't make the excuse. I got to go find someone or call someone that's in the bedroom. Be like, Hey, you know, go turn that valve off for me, please. I, I responsibly shouldn't go in there. Man, it's such a reality for so many growers. Um, I actually have a question, Eduardo, that was an amazing question. Um, can you guys give me like a quick rundown or maybe just a little definition of what a thrip is? Um, yeah, like, what is that? Ooh, you almost gotta bring up a picture. Their wings actually look like feathers, which is pretty cool. They are these itty bitty bugs. Let's see if that... I can uh, share my screen here. Thrips. Yes, that basically, you know, suck sap out of your plants and slowly try to kill it. Um, you know, you see signs of them, basically they're larvae 
not larvae, but at a young stage, they really eat the leaf up and you can see their gray little poop all over it. Yep. And great way to obviously verify that they are thrips is put them under your microscope. And uh, if they're not thrips, that's another easy way to identify what they are. <laughs> yeah. the uh, If you scroll back up, Jason, that one diagram there with the fluffy wings, if you get them under a loop, you can usually see that much detail. That's a straight up tip off that you've got thrips. And generally they are quite a bit smaller than most of the things you're going to see on your plants. You guys know I love talking about integrated pest management. So can you guys tell me how, how does Arroyo help in a situation like this where you might find these in your facility? Well, I mean, you know, the biggest thing I see is attaching that information to harvest groups and then keeping track of your IPM applications and what pests, because, uh, as we go through, you know, repeated cycles of, you know, sometimes the same strains, sometimes different, but if you're at any facility that's sizable, you're running so many crops through, it's hard to, you know, keep that straight in your brain sometimes. And you're like, Hey, we've got all these different strategies going. We got 10 different rooms. We're trying to treat all these different things at once. Um, it's really easy to let data slip through the cracks and forget things like, Oh my God, we just saw an aphid. But we are in a greenhouse and it is October. Like, yep, that'll happen. They're all trying to come inside. So we need to respond on this crop. But, you know, maybe when we start in December, might not have to worry about it. We might have a whole different IPM strategy at that point. So that's that's the biggest way I think Arroyo helps people with IPM. And then also just maintaining the right climatic environment. You know, if it's too dry, that definitely helps. Or not too dry. If it's dry enough, that helps with certain bugs. And then also, you know, when we talk about botrytis, powdery mildew, root rot, any of the common things we see as far as disease and cannabis goes. Um, generally speaking, once we move to a controlled environment, the best way to avoid disease is to not provide an environment that can cultivate it. You know, if you want to run 65 degrees overnight and you can't get down to 45% or so humidity, well, we've created a, a perfect place to culture some mold. So, you know that's what we got to be aware of. You know, there's certain things that we just inadvertently create a beautiful environment for, you know, and, and same thing goes with uh, like, let's say irrigation lines. You know, if we've got uh, a compost tea, we run through there sometimes a biological additive and then a nutrient soup that's sitting at, you know, 75 to 80 degrees all the time. Most of the time. Yeah. We're going to get some biofilms and the stuff's going to grow in there. There's not a whole lot we can do to change that other than adjust our inputs perhaps start using some, some, uh, some hypochlorous, you know, change, change what we do physically and procedurally, because anytime we've got to introduce an extra input, that's money we're either not making or losing, depending on how you want to look at it. Yeah. So it's kind of just breaking down into simple terms of what you're saying is, uh, Roy is most helpful for IPM in observational logging and plant health. Uh, plant health to obviously keep them less susceptible to uh, predation and then observational logging things like communicating within our interface taking pictures of severity and logging uh, pesticide applications yeah and that's a great way if you go and look at a run in the past and you go wow uh, that is way more applications than we normally have what the heck was going on because like i said it's really easy to do these things reactively and then, you know, sometimes if we're, you're facing a lot of problems in your grow, it's such a whirlwind that even on the next run, you don't, you're still being reactive. You're not saying like, Hey, we did this program that works. It's just, uh Oh, bug, bug, spray, spray, <laughs> you know? So registration of everything you're doing is the best you can do, you know, treat, treat all this. If you can, like you would be treating any kind of st scientific study as much data capture as possible and capturing it and organizing it in a way that you can actually analyze. Nice. Living and learning. Uh, thank you guys for that. Um, Eduardo did have a follow-up. That makes so much sense. I've been going into uh, flower, which is week three, going into the bedroom. And so never thought of cross-contamination. Dang. Um, yeah, we also got another question over on YouTube. Um, burn, burn tires, burn trees wrote in. Uh, sorry, I'm late, but if sugars are higher, won't that naturally pre prevent thrips and other problems? What do you guys have to say about that? No. Thrips love sugar. Um, I, I get maybe where you're coming from on an osmotic difference, but the way thrips work is they have a a mouthpiece that they actually puncture, you know, the epidermis of the plant with and suck the sap out. 
So a sturdier or hardier plant stem and surface of the plant can definitely help resist that. But all that's going to do is make them concentrate on that softer leaf surface. But if we wanted to use, if we did want to use bricks level or sugar as, you know, a uh, evaluation of plant health at a given point in the growing cycle, we might be able to conclude that plants that are producing more carbohydrates, more sugars do have a better immune system just because they're a healthier plant. Awesome. Yeah. You'll have to let us know if you have a follow-up to that uh, question for entire burn trees. Um, but yeah, that's it for YouTube right now. So I'm going to pass it back over to you, Keisha. Awesome. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. Thrips, hot topic here. Uh, Mikey wrote in thrips love to hide as a max with a little H2O2 on all services every three, day, three days and strict room isolation. The Western flower thrip is a terrible thing. And uh, he also spoke to those leaves being tastier when sugars are present. <laughs> so yeah, thrips. Who knew? I learning something every time. <laughs> awesome. All right. We're going to keep it moving to our next uh, Instagram question here. Lock Key wrote in, can you elaborate on the growing cues we send to the plants when introducing dissolved oxygen to the root zone? Is it manipulating respiration rates? Um, Very likely going to be. So obviously roots are one part of the plant that need oxygen and, and what we're doing there is is keeping a healthy fresh supply of it so dissolved oxygen in your irrigation is definitely going to help keep that uh, an aerobic environment um, rather than an anaerobic environment in which you can start to see rot and, and uh, other issues in the substrate so uh, you know obviously ways that you can increase dissolved oxygen in your feed would be lowering the temperature of it. Obviously we don't want to go lower too far because that can shock the roots, cause plant issues. Um, and then also things like air stones. Yeah. I mean, in basically just kind of nail it there, you know, when we put that dissolved oxygen in, we're really up, upping the rate of cellular respiration inside of those roots. So we're kicking them into overdrive. All those root functions are functioning at a higher level than if we don't have that introduced oxygen. And that's part of why during generative steering, we're utilizing that spacing out of that introducing oxygen to really slow down the plant. If that makes sense, you know, so if the roots can't breathe quite as well, they can't, you know, force the plant to build as much structure up above. And we're talking about stretch, for instance, Uh, there's a hormonal condition inside the plant that dictates morphology. So if we give it more oxygen at that point in time, We're going to produce, you know, more stem growth, bigger plant structure overall. And that's kind of the cues we're working with there is when the plant's wanting to grow vegetatively or build structure, that's when we're going to try to choke it down and limit that level of respiration production. Yes. Thank you for that. Excellent. Lucky. Thank you for that question. All right. Keeping it moving here. Just a reminder to on with who have, everybody who's on with us live. We're about, we're about rounding the hour off. So if you have any questions, now's to the time to drop those in the chat. Blockhead Buds wrote in, I've tried no CO2 on multiple grows versus with. Maybe it's my environment, but I haven't seen a noticeable difference. Why would that be, do you think? And they're wondering if it matters if you're in a tent, sealed space, et cetera. Obviously, with a tent, you wouldn't use exhaust fans. Got any thoughts on that? Sure. So let's just break down the science of photosynthesis. And when we look at the um, equation, the stoichiometric equation, you have water and CO2 catalyzed by light. And that's going to be producing sugars, which obviously the the plant is using for growth. Um, That being said, obviously, CO2 is probably one of the most critical elements that we can add to a grow room if, like you had said, environmental factors are right, including especially the amount of light that you have on your plants. So if we can balance all three parts of those equations, uh, amount of light, amount of water, and CO2, then we're going to have as least amount of waste as possible going into that equation. Um, it doesn't matter what type of um, environment, I, like as far as the, you know, the tent, greenhouse, that type of thing. Uh, not really. I mean, that's obviously going to change how you can keep the CO2 in your room. Obviously, when we're working in a uh, closed loop HVAC indoor type of situation, when we add CO2, uh, 
all of it is going to either be used up by the plants, recirculated, or leave when uh, a person enters or exits the door, which is really nice. We don't have to uh, add quite as much CO2 to maintain the appropriate PPM levels. Uh, and a greenhouse definitely can be tricky. Uh, obviously, we've all seen greenhouses where we're using um, propane or natural gas burners to add CO2. Uh, anytime it's something like that, we'll definitely want the injection in the front of the room so that, uh, you know, if it's if it's a, a horizontal airflow, um, if it's a, like a vertical vented, then we'll definitely probably want those as low into the canopy as possible as well. So, uh Greenhouse is a little trickier, something like a tent in your house. It's just going to depend on how much circulation you have to run through it and how you're conditioning your air. Yeah. You know, that, that's what I was going to say. Since the tent got brought in, um, you know, if we're talking about specifically growing at home, you know, your ambient CO2 levels outside and indoors, most places around what, four to 500 PPM. So what we usually see, you might live in an area where that's elevated due to, you know, industrial activity or something like that. But what it'll really boil down to is, uh, hey, if you're growing with a 600 watt light at home, you probably aren't pushing PPFD high enough to really hit the point where that CO2 is going to make a big difference. And then also, um, I don't know how it goes. How many people are in your house? What's that like? Do you have a bunch of dogs? Do you have a lot of CO2 producing uh, elements there? Do you have a, do you brew beer in your basement too? <laughs> you know, but <coughs> really what it comes down to is that PPFD. So you know, if you're in a situation where let's say you've already invested into your grow, you've got your lights set up, your HVAC, everything, and you're thinking about CO2, get a light meter. See if that's something that you really even need to approach yet, because there there is a potential chance that after you've got your whole light, your light set up, ready to go, got your spacing down and everything that you might not have uniform 1200 PPFD coverage. You know, at the end of the day, if the majority of your room is down at five or 600, just because of your lighting placement and choices, CO2 is not going to help you out at all. Yeah. So, uh, you know, what's the easiest way to raise CO2 in your room? You can spend more time in it as a person. Uh, mm -hmm. Surprisingly, humans actually produce quite a bit of CO2. Uh, you may not be at the levels that you want, but uh, kind of just a fun way to help your plants. Yeah. And I think, you know, that's, that's another one of those things like we've talked about, uh, you know, if you just go out and try to grow some weed in your basement or in a small scale, you can have pretty good success for variety due to a variety of different factors that are present in that particular environment. Um, moving out of that environment into something that's fully controlled is often a big step. And that's where some of these little things like CO2 come in, modulating our light levels more, having more control over temperature. Cause I know like when I go to grow at home, I don't really like it at 80 where I'll keep my veg plants, but I know my flower plants do great around 70 degrees where my house likes to be. And it'll be just a few degrees warmer inside that tent. So food for thought for sure. I mean, I know I could sit in a grow room and just stare at the plants and let my CO2 help them out. I don't know if, I don't know if yeah. it'd be enough. <laughs> yeah. If you're just, if you're just there, you know, I'm if you're there. in a situation okay. where you got like, let's say you got four dogs that live at your house. <laughs> the suckers are pretty snit all day. <laughs> Excellent. All right, Mandy, I think we've got something over on YouTube. Yeah. Yeah. We're getting some more questions over on YouTube. Mr. Grinch wrote in any tips for dealing with springtails. I'm doing flood and drain and cocoa. They end up floating in my reservoir. I've cleaned and left my tent empty for a month and they eventually come back. Hmm. It sounds like you have a, a local population of them nearby that is probably migrating into your tent. Um, I would for sure check a bunch of, uh, if you have house plants, check those out. Um, you you got to deal with the source. <laughs> I mean, it's unlikely that it's coming in with your media, although that is possible. You didn't tell us whether you're using pasteurized pressed media, organic, what, you know, what, what you're going with. But typically something like springtails, once they're in, we've got them in the facility and uh, IPM is no different than any other soil borne bug really. Is everyone just dealing with pests right now? Everyone just, yeah, drop, drop the pests that you're dealing with in the chat. Yeah, it's, um, it's the fall. Yeah. They're all trying to come in from outside is what's going uh -huh. on. Everything you can imagine wants to stay warm. Never ending. Yeah. Mr. Grinch, you'll have to let us know if you have a follow-up, but um, that's it over on YouTube right now. So back to you, Keisha. Thank you, Mandy. Yeah. This is the pest control episode. So yeah, please let us know what pests you guys are dealing with. This is really interesting stuff. I, I don't even know what a springtail is either. 
Yeah. Just to, you know, remind everybody, uh, that the best advice that you can, if you are looking for advice is you know, if find a, a pest management, a licensed pest management person, uh, in, in your area that, you know, that, that can give you technically and legally that advice to apply specifically what you need to apply. Uh, you know, we're just talking about things that have worked for people in the past, uh, things that are, are general processes that can be helpful, but the, the best thing that you can do is, is get some, uh, professional, uh, advice to, to drop in, take a look at what you're dealing with, and then they can specifically recommend the chemicals you may need if, if, if that, or, uh, predatory bugs, if, if you're lucky by chance. Oh, ab- absolutely. I agree, Jason. I, full disclaimer, I've only taken the test for the Northwest. So Washington, Oregon, and Idaho, when I go to other regions, um, sometimes these conversations kind of fall apart a little bit because, they are not allowed to use most of the products that I'm used to using, for instance. So the only way I can help them is say, okay, I know these certain beneficial bugs seem to have worked for me on certain pests. But, you know, as an example, if I just go four or five hours north of where we're at, the whole game changes, you know, can't use pyrethrins, can't use a bunch of different products that we're allowed to use down here. So that changes the game. Um, But at the end of the day, you know, most of it comes back to cultural practices, SOPs in your facility, and being rigid with them, you know, it's like, uh, and, and looking failure right in the eye and sometimes and being willing to admit that there's a flaw, you know, if you've got a root aphid issue, but you've also got your mom's in your bedroom, I don't care how much money you spend on spray or drenches. Like we're going to probably continue to deal with that issue because while we're running the facility, it's hard to not have moms, right? We got to keep our clones going. And if we don't take and build a separate space where we can really actually isolate those moms and make sure we're not bringing any of those uh, root aphids out, then we're just going to be chasing our tail. You know, there's there's almost no point in acting on that other than basic remedial IPM, because unless you're willing to change the source of the problem, you know, you're never going to fully solve it. Yes, as Biangin uh, wrote in here, basic pests over here, gnats and leaf hoppers from outside. They're all over the property on the vines. Going to need to start using predatory bugs. Yeah, and honestly, that's like one of the best things you can do is work with a predatory bug supplier. And make sure, you know, once you get on a program with them and you're getting really fresh, viable bugs, introducing them at the right time, not exposing them to a you know, freeze out situation. Don't stick the wrong ones in the fridge. And yeah, you know, when they come in a box and it says apply within, within 24 hours of receiving, do that, you know, follow those directions to a T the beneficial insects are actually incredibly effective in most situations. Yeah. And I was at a conference recently here in Vegas where they were talking about how important it is to actually check the bugs that you have received. So if you, you know, Mm -hmm. get a package of, of predatory, um, bugs, open up a package, look at them under the microscope and, and get an idea. Hey, you know, maybe I've got a 10% death rate in this package. They're good to deploy. But if I've got an 80% death rate in there, then, uh, you know, talk to the supplier of those, get yourself a fresh batch and, and you're, you're not going to be doing much by deploying something that is not in a condition to mitigate the, the pests. Yeah. And, and, you know, yeah, exactly. You definitely realize that a bunch of stuff in our industry has expiration dates and those expiration dates are very, very important. You know, even if we're talking about things like hypochlorous acid or sanitate, all these cleaning agents, they expire, they lose efficacy over time. So you want to keep that fresh. The same with your pesticides and your bugs. You know, we want to stay on top of it, stay as fresh as possible. And then, you know, like Jason said, check them out. <laughs> if you've got a bunk supplier, call them out on it, you know. I've definitely done that a little bit in the past with uh, like microbial input suppliers, you know, send someone a, an email with a picture of a Petri dish and you go that I don't, I don't count many colonies in there, but it's exactly one or zero. <laughs> That's not what the label said should be in there. Um, and then you can determine, okay, well, I'm not going to use that product unless I can actually get the freshest version of it and test it again first. You know, there's a lot of, uh, Hey, this is an industry, you know, there's a lot of different ways to make money and there's a lot of different approaches and how to do this. So the more you search for specialized products that do very specific things, hopefully the more you're going to find. That's a great reminder. It's all about those SOPs. So doing your due diligence is important, especially maintaining the longevity of your business. All right, Mandy, I think we've got a lot of action on YouTube, sending it over to you. 
Yeah, you know what's going on over there. Um, Diane wrote in a couple questions. Um, on the topic of uh, pests, what should I use against white aphids? Again, where do you live? Because <laughs> uh, I'd love to tell you an answer that you cannot use in a lot of places. And then at the end of the day, though, safe answer. Clean your, be clean and veg and uh, get some beneficials. There's a whole host of uh, predatory bugs that can be used against aphids. Um, the, the key thing is just try to keep that population down. Any kind of a knockdown spray you can do in between veg and flower, for instance, right when you move into the flower room is going to be super helpful. Um, but yeah, like Jason said, the, the best thing you can do is probably talk to someone or go yourself. You know, if you're invested into this business, go take an IPM class and get certified to buy and apply pesticides in your region. You know, at the, at the very worst, you're going to spend, you know, a couple of weeks studying your butt off and learning a lot about chemicals. And, uh, at the best, if your weed farm folds, you can go be a pesticide applicator. <laughs> <Wow>. <laughs> if you want to talk about my backup plans, <laughs> <clears throat> but you know, that's, that's the best you can do because really the regulations change even, uh, even in how we have to record this stuff, like what I have been required to do in Washington in terms of the way we record it, the forms we use and how long you have to keep that data on site, what you have to submit for the state, totally different than California, which is totally different than Michigan, which is totally different than Colorado, for instance. So do your due diligence and make sure you're compliant. And another thing to remember with p pesticide law, a lot of it's retroactive. So basically, you know, no matter what state you're in, they say, Hey, keep these records. So that if someone says you messed up, then we'll come check and find you. There's not a lot of out front. Um, the state isn't a consultant usually that you just call and say this or that. They'll say, go read the regs, read the label. See, learn your classes of pesticides in your region and how they need to work. And we all got to study up. Sorry, go ahead. <laughs> anecdotally, uh, I know of a few places that have called the state with questions and the state will gladly send out a compliance officer to check on your facility recently after you submit those questions. So um, definitely be cautious on, on how you're trying to find the, the right answers to those sources. Yeah. And you know what? Honestly, a great resource for a lot of this is... Uh, what whichever state you know, usually land grant universities out west but i know back east that works a little differently sometimes but whatever your state ag school is generally they'll have an extension program with someone you can talk to for free and really get a scope on what you're allowed to use what you're not what kind of application rates and then honestly especially if you're going to use that resource if you've got access to an area with an entomology department talk to them they are very excited to educate the public you might be able to get hooked up to that pesticide applicator certification program through that. And you're going to get access to uh, people that have done this in many different industries with a lot of different species of bugs. And they know specifically the mode of action behind a lot of these chemicals and can actually help make a recommendation or help you wade through and say, okay, look, this class of chemicals does not work with this genus of bugs. So even though I'm not a weed expert, I can tell you this solution is not going to solve your problem. And that's, again, a whole different specialization than what Jason and I have. You know, people study for many years to get to that. So you might as well utilize it. And guess what? We're talking about those uh, you know, state ag schools. Y you pay taxes to have access to that free information. Utilize it. That's what extension programs are all about. I worked in one years ago. And guess what? The state paid me to go talk to farmers <laughs> and help them grow better crops. It's pretty cool. That is really cool. I did not know that. Um, that's so interesting. Uh, I, there's just so much to learn about pests, you guys. Uh, it's very clear we need to do a whole episode just for that, too. Um, but yeah, we're, uh, we got a couple more minutes. Diane had a couple more questions, too. Um, so he wants to know, is there a point to top, dr to top dress with dolomite lime or gypsum in my cocoa? Um, instead of that, can I just add them in the tank? I wouldn't add them in the tank. Uh, that's kind of a recipe for signing up for clogged emitters and tearing out your irrigation system and putting a new one in. Um, pretty much anything of, of that consistency would be better top dressed. Absolutely. Yeah. The last, uh, the last injector I saw to inject a like liquid lime concentrate into soil was a lot more than you want to spend. 
to actually have it function trying to push something through and the materials you'd have to buy as far as like micronized gypsum or stuff or something like that incredibly expensive if you do want to use those as amendments you mix them into your cocoa before you plant basically you know if you're going to make if you're going to build your own soilless mix there's very few things that you're going to top dress that are really going to be that effective you know even if we're talking about like top dressing with guano or something like yeah we want a time frame you know it's way better than top dressing blend that stuff up into a tea and get it down into your root zone yeah and both of those sound like probably just purposely to try and do a, uh, fix some type of ph issue uh in that substrate mm-hmm. so um you know just keep that in mind maybe it's something you can avoid uh, by modifying your feed uh, ph as well yeah you know years ago before i wanted to even like when i first started with cocoa that was a recommendation is using azomite and gypsum to help buffer that ph if you're using tap water still just you know maybe first step invest in a, a nicer ph meter than maybe what you currently have or get one and start making sure you're ph in your input water and start paying attention to your runoff water really hard sometimes uh making adjustments for that local water quality just ends up being necessary especially if you're blowing up to a, a more commercial level you know you, depending on where you're sourcing your azomite and gypsum those aren't necessarily incredibly expensive things but water filtration might be a more sustainable long-term solution if that's what you're dealing with Awesome. Thank you guys for that. We had one more question um, over on YouTube. Um, Diane also wants to know, um, and I might pronounce this incorrectly, uh, is Pinerith, uh, does that pass the lab test? So if you're if you're spraying any kind of pyrethrin, there's like several different kinds. A lot of them actually have natural plant sources. Um, the, the answer is yes, if you spray it too late. Any pesticide we put on, like pyrethrins especially, have a limited half-life. So that's where like our REI, our required entry interval, comes in. So basically, you know, when you spray that on, it does have a half-life. So after 12 hours, enough of that product has degraded that it's not going to be neurotoxic to you or I. <coughs> that doesn't mean that there will be undetectable quantities. So if you're dealing with pests after about week four, week three, you know, once you start to get bud set, you really don't want to spray that with anything if you can help it whether it's a pyrethrin because then you risk failing the test even though maybe the concentration is so low that it doesn't present a health problem but you know even moving on like when we talk about horticultural oils do we want to have it you know cottonseed oil mint oil i mean there's a whole host of aromatic oils that are used horticulturally we're trying to produce terpenes for specific wonderful smells i don't think i need peppermint in there to mess it up you know, and not, not only that, but theoretically, you know, it, it just doesn't, you could maybe see parts of it on the bud. I don't know about that, but I think it, it can do something to the end quality and should people be smoking traces of those oils as well? You know, maybe we're not totally sure on that. Um, and then, yeah, as far as, uh, pyrethrins go not good late and, you know, same with different kinds of compost teas and stuff, man, if you fail an E. coli test, uh, quit spraying the compost teas. <laughs> Back off and clean the crap out of your grower. I don't Super know about important. you, but sometimes I think I would be rather be smoking the bugs than the pesticides using to kill the bugs. Yep. Well, I can see those bugs. Even if I get it in the jar, I'm just like, oh, hey, buddy, break the nug open and scrape it off. Oh gosh, so true. And sorry for butchering that word so badly, you guys. Um, but yeah, it's a weird one. The- <laughs> I'm going to have to practice it. Um, but yeah, I think that's it over on YouTube for now. So back over to you, Keisha. Awesome, Mandy. Thank you so much. Gosh, so many good questions this week. We have one more from in- Instagram. So we'll close out our hour with this one. My body 45, I think it was Mr. Body 45, 45 wrote in. What percent of dry back is too low? Ooh, depends on your media size for sure. Uh, if you have an approach, let's say um, normal size plants, normal size media under 10% is pretty concerning to me. You know, if I, if I see under 10% and I, and you tell me, Hey, I'm in a one and a half gallon pot with a four foot tall plant, five foot tall plant. If I see 8%, you know, let's, we need to start looking at your environment. You know, you have, you have some other issues. That's a, an unhealthy rate of transpiration for the plant or not optimal anyways. 
Yeah, and just some caveats on there. You know, if we're thinking about if the plant is just transplanted into a new media, don't necessarily get too concerned about a, a low dryback amount. We're talking about, you know, a rooted plant that we would expect at that time to be hitting the, say, 15 to 20 percent drybacks like we would do doing in generative or vegetative steering. Yeah. And then also, you know, media size is a, is a huge part of that. Again, if you are oversized media for your undersized plant, we're not going to see that big of a dryback. It's just physically that plant. There's a bigger reservoir that that plant needs to pull more water out of to show that big of a dryback. Yeah, sure. I mean, if I'm in a 10 gallon substrate yeah. and, uh, you know, my plant drinks a gallon in 24 hours, that's still only a 10% dryback, which, uh, you know, a gallon would sustain, or would sustain a very large cannabis plant. Yep. And then, you know, at that point we're getting into uh, potentially all sorts of problems with not properly flushing nutrients out with not getting oxygen to the places they need to go in the root zone. And that's something that's important, you know, when we're talking about running straight cocoa or rock wool, some of these higher water concentration holding media, um, we don't want to keep it back up. We do want to get that 10 to 25%, even up to 30% dry back because what that's doing is pulling oxygen into the root zone and making sure that it stays aerobic. Awesome, you guys. Thank you so much. That's our last question submitted uh, on Instagram. Mandy, anything else coming in over on YouTube? Um, I think that that was it. Yeah. Thank you guys for submitting all your questions over there. Awesome. Yes. Thank you so much. And uh, Jason and Seth, before we wrap up, any final words? Good luck getting through this fall. Things should uh, settle down with the bugs when it gets uh, cold enough. Yeah. And remember, Croptober's over. Hang in there. The new year's just around the corner. <laughs> That's right, everybody. Hang in there. Jason, Seth, thank you so much for another great conversation. Mandy, thank you for co-moderating with me. Thank you to everybody who joined this week's episode of Office Hours. We do this every Thursday. And the best way to get answers from the experts is to join us live. If you have any questions about Arroyo, feel free to book a demo. Our experts will walk you through it, show you how Arroyo can be used to improve your cultivation production process. But as always, if there's any topic you'd like covered in a future episode of Office Hours. Post questions anytime via the Arroyo app. That's a newer thing. Uh, you can also feel free to drop them in the chat. Shoot us an email at support.arroyo at metergroup.com. Send us a DM on Instagram. We want to hear from you. We record every session. We'll email everybody in attendance a link to the video from today's discussion. It'll also live on the Arroyo channel. A YouTube channel, like, subscribe, and share while you're there. And if you find these conversations useful, please do spread the word. Thank you all so much. We'll see you next time, and we will see you at MJ BizCon. Bye.